All right, so today we're going to talk about a little bit more about Shiny. This is our second meetup um, on Shiny, but if you weren't here on, for the first one, you don't have to worry. It's not going to be too built off of that one slash I'm going to go over uh, what we went over last time. So if you weren't here for that, you'll you'll get yourself caught up. Uh, if you do want like more in depth on what we did last time, that video is going to be or it already is on YouTube on the Our Ladies Global account. Uh, we have a playlist called Our Lady Survivor where you can find all of our videos there. So um, that's available if you if you find that you want to go over kind of some of the stuff I go over in the first few minutes of this meet up a little bit more in in depth. Yeah, so uh, like we learned last time, Shiny is the web interface for making dashboards with R and they're reactive so that the user can change values and this can update what they're seeing in your graphs or um, in the values that or tables that you show on the screen. So today we're gonna obviously need the Shiny package. Um, don't actually really have to load it for the markdown, but I'll go ahead and do it anyway, just in case I'm forgetting something. Yeah, and so we, last time when we looked at Shiny, we learned kind of how to start Shiny from a template that our studio has built in to allow you to get going with Shiny a little bit faster. So um, again, how you do that is you go to File, New Project, uh, well, or you can do File, New File, depending if you wanna open like a project um, environment which saves your variables. I'm just gonna do a new file because it's more of a show app and we don't need to like save all of the settings for next time. So you can also go to File, New File, and if you do shiny web app, you can give it a name and you get the template for this um, old faithful geyser, geyser data. So we looked at this last time, but this is a basic shiny app where you just have a histogram, which is um, showing how often this geyser erupted. And then sorry, to little... sorry to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt. Are we supposed to be seeing the shiny app? Because we are, we're only seeing our studio. Oh, yes. Good point. Thank you. <laughs> there. So I guess I have to share my whole screen. Um, okay. So yeah, this is the shiny app. So again, if, if you missed that because I didn't have it open, um, you run the app with this little button here, and that will pop up an example of the app. So how it will look when it's online. So this is the one from the template. It has the histogram that shows how often uh, the geyser erupts. And you have this little slider where you can change how the graph looks by changing the number of bins. So this is a super basic Shiny app. And that's kind of what we want to achieve today is I want to remind you of how you work with all of these inputs and how and teach you a little bit about how Shiny works in terms of theory. Uh, and then at the end, we're going to look at doing a little graph inside of Shiny, how to integrate like a ggplot into Shiny. Okay. So every Shiny app, let me try and make this a little bit bigger. Every Shiny app has three key parts. Um, the first one is the user interface. So this is the basic stage where we put anything that we want the users or visitors to see. And this is where all the input comes into the app. So this is the kind of the user facing side. And um, anything you put here is what the user sees or can input. And this is always defined as UI. And it's generally, so everything that we've seen so far has started kind of been within this uh, fluid page command, which just sets up basically the web page. So for example, this is a very simple example where we have a page that only has the text hello world and nothing else. And the second important part is the server. So the server takes the input from the user and um, it, use, it can change things about it or add things to it and basically customizes the output that so takes the input, uses it to determine the output, and then to send this output back to the user interface so that the user interface knows what to show. So this is called server and it's always defined as a function with three inputs or with these kind of um, arguments here, input, output, and session. So this is always what it will look like. This one has nothing in it because all we're doing in this little app is actually showing the text hello world. 
And finally, you, always, you have to have this shiny app command, which combines the UI and the server into one. It just integrates them into one app. So if we had all these in our shiny app here, um, this one actually, you always have to load the library shiny when you want to do an app. Uh, and if we just had this basic setup with this UI, this kind of empty server command, and then the shiny app putting it together, we would have this very basic app that just says hello world. So I'm basically just showing you this to remind you that anytime we want to work with a Shiny app, we have to load the Shiny app, we have to define the user interface as a page, we have to set up the server function, and then we have to put the two together with the Shiny app command. Okay, but of course that's not a very interesting web page. It just says hello world on it. So last time we looked at three different types of inputs that you could use to yeah, gather interaction from the users of the web page. Um, the first one of those was select input, which creates a drop down box of options. So we did this with the uh, greeting. We had like a greeting question. And you see, we had the select input command, your function here. And the first argument is called input ID. This is how we later find, or this is kind of how it's saved, the input is saved in terms of what the server can pull and look at. So we've called this greeting. The label is the question that we wanna ask above the dropdown. So who do you wanna greet? And then we give the choices. And here you see, we've defined this array where we give a choice like world, but behind the scenes, it's really linked to like a long text string called hello world. Um, and friends is linked to hi friends and people is linked to hey people. So that's how we gather the input for this dropdown. Then we wanna go over down here to our server and we can pull the input that the user has given to this question by calling input dollar sign greeting. And we always put it, we, we had, so last time we didn't really talk about why, but we always put it in this render text command and we can create an output from that. So output, we give it a name, which is full greeting so that in the user interface, we can also show the output, which here is a text output called full greeting. This example comes exactly from um, last workshop. So in case that was a little bit quick, don't worry, this is something that it's not gonna hold you up from understanding the rest. Uh, but I just want to go over it quickly. So if it's a little bit quick, make sure you go back and um, watch that video if you if you want to, if, if you're getting lost. <laughs> but here, just to show you what that would look like, now we have the input, the select input, which allows us to pick between worlds, friends, and people, and the text output, which um, the server has behind the scenes converted into this longer text string. So you can have, hi, friends, hello, world, or hey, people. Um, is there questions on that? Uh, no, no questions. I was just sending the link around and I'll try to find the video in case people want to watch back okay. later. Great, thanks. Okay, so basically the main things to again notice there is that we have the user interface, which was this fluid page, which takes the input and shows the output. And the server, which is really where the input becomes the output or the input, the output is determined using the input. And we saw a couple other um, examples of this last time as well. So one of them was the text input command, which is a freehand text box. And you'll see here, we have kind of the same question, who do you want to greet, given as the label again, we're still calling this input the greeting. And the value is going to be like the text that's in the text box before you type something. So we give the users the ability to put in the input and we also want to show them the output. And then the server here is taking the input here, combining it into a longer string, which is just hello plus whoever you want to greet plus exclamation. It's rendering this as text and saving it to the output full greeting so that it can be called here by full greeting. So you see this is kind of like this ping pong going back and forth between the user interface and the server. 
And so if we run that, then let me try to move this so you can see the code at the same time. Yeah, then you can type your name and you can see also as soon as I type something, shiny update. So it doesn't wait for me to like tell it that I'm finished or it's, it has to be kind of always ready to update. So as soon as I type something in here, it will update. It goes to the server and it updates the output. Okay, so that's pretty similar to the select input. It just looks a little bit different. Um, and we had to kind of make the greeting ourselves here for this purpose. And finally, what we looked at was the slider input, which will create a numeric slider where you can drag the number. So you can drag like a little yeah, slider so that you can see the number. Maybe I'll um, show it to you first and then explain the code. So this one, we um, just asked the user how old they are, they put in their age, and it converts it into dog years um, and outputs, outputs that below. Um, yeah, I'm seeing a little bit of chat activity. Is everything, any questions before I? No questions, no worries. OK. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this one with the slider input, you can see in the UI before we had text input, now we just have slider input. We again have to give it an input ID. Um, the, the label here is optional. So here I hadn't put it, but you could always label this if you wanted to. So we're naming it age. We have to put the question, which is called the label. And then for the slider, we put the min, the max, and the default value of the slider. So if we wanted to like, we can make this be only 10 and start at the value 10. And then you could see that our slider will only go up to 10 and it starts by default at the age of 10. So we get the input there, we call it age. And then here we've done kind of a transformation to that because we don't want to return the age value. We want to return the age value times seven because we're doing dog years and we're assuming that a dog every one year in a, in a human's life is seven years in a dog's life. So, uh, Within the render text, again, like we, we always had in the server, we can make kind of an intermediary step where we calculate the dog age as the input age times seven. Again, this input dollar sign means that we're pulling it from the input from the UI. And then we make the dog age greeting um, by pasting these strings together here and returning it at the output. Yeah, and so then we have the UI with the input, we send it to the server, the server does something to it and then sends it back to the output here in the UI. Okay, so that was a um, pretty quick recap of just like how you do inputs into Shiny and the basic uh, parts of Shiny being like this UI and the server and a little bit of, we just kind of got an impression of how the two work together. But now I wanna dive a little bit into the theoretical. So it'll get a little theoretical here for a few minutes because Shiny and R programming are really different. And sometimes uh, it can be kind of frustrating because you don't understand why Shiny is either not doing what you told it to do, but not throwing an error or why something that really feels like it should be working is not working at all. And so it is it is important to understand kind of how Shiny thinks and how it's set up under the hood. So um, this can be summed up in a couple, so there's a couple of different things going on here. One of them is the difference between what's called imperative and declarative programming. So when you're working in R, you're usually working in imperative coding programming, which is kind of like giving a direct command to R and telling it to execute it immediately, right? So if you think in terms of R, You'd be thinking something like paste together hello and the user's name and then send it to the variable called output greeting. That's how R works, right? So you're telling it directly to do something right away. Um, in comparison, when you're working in Shiny, you have to think of this in kind of the way that you're telling Shiny if and when you need to send output greeting to the browser or to the UI, this is how you should do it. You should paste together these two things. 
this is called declarative programming. And this is different because if Shiny never needs to find output greeting, then it will never calculate. It will never paste together hello in the user's name. It won't go, it won't tell you, it won't complain. Like, why did you tell me to do something that I never have to do? It just will skip that part and it won't, won't ever do it. So for example, say you um, in R, you kind of typoed. Yeah, here, for example. So in R, say you typoed your variable and you, you spelled greeting instead of greeting, then R is going to immediately throw an error and it's going to say, you know, you misspelled your variable name as greeting. We can't find that. You're kind of like demanding that I find greeting, but I can't find it because it doesn't exist. And so now I don't know what to do and I'm just going to stop. Shiny, on the other hand, because it's declarative, is like, okay, if I ever need to find gretting, um, now I know how to make it, no problem. I don't mind that you're telling me to do something nonsensical or something that I don't need because um, I'm just never gonna look for that. So if you never tell it to look for gretting, it will never worry that your gretting variable is problematic or that it doesn't exist. Um, because of this, so we know in R that we always program from top to bottom. So R will do like line one and then line two and then line three and then line four. Every single time it's never gonna jump around. So if you um, if you look for the variable greeting in line five but you don't define it until line six then at line five R is gonna say the variable greeting doesn't exist. This is not possible. It's gonna break, right? But Shiny is using these reactive dependencies so it can jump around and order doesn't matter that much to it. So if it's looking for the variable greeting, it can go look for it in, in, in a way that's not necessarily top down. It can kind of jump around and try to find what it needs based on reactive dependencies, which means, um, which is kind of like how Shiny is working behind the scenes, looking for things that are connected, like an input that's connected to an output. And, um, because of kind of some of these func some of these properties, functions can be kind of useful in R, uh, but you don't really have to do them. You can kind of write stuff out over and over again if you want. But in Shiny, functions are going to be pretty essential. We talked a little bit about function syntax last time. If you need to recap, but you basically need to work within functions in order to make any sense of what Shiny is doing. Just because this it has this kind of more a bit of a looser style of programming to where things don't happen quite as, um, yeah, imperatively. So they don't happen directly and strictly as you say. Uh, okay, so that's, that's the, in a nutshell, the difference between Shiny and R programming. I got a lot of this from the book, Mastering Shiny, and it does a pretty good job of explaining this, uh, but I hope it'll be clear. I'm gonna give a few examples that have to do with reactivity which should help you get like a bit of an intuition about how Shiny works. Uh, any questions before I go on to that? Uh, no, no questions. Okay. Okay, so reactivity, what's reactivity? We talk about Shiny as reactive web apps, but what does that really mean? Um, Shiny's reactivity is a big part of what makes it different from a regular script. And this basically boiled down is that each person that uses your app needs to get a different result, right? So if I'm using it at the same time as Julia and I have the input value of um, say age, well, me and Julia are the same age, but if we were not and I put my age at 18 and Julia puts her age as 45, then on my computer, I need to see a different result for the dog years variable than Julia does. And I can't see my slider move when her when she moves her slider, but everything has to be individualized to the person who's looking at the app. And most of this uh, reactivity, reactivity is that a typo? Um, happens in the server function because this is where the input is turned to the output. And as you saw when I was typing my name in this greeting box, the the output has to be reactively. Um, created not only individually for each person, but also instantaneously or basically instantaneously. So that when I typed like KY, then it said like, hi, Kai, it didn't say like Kyla. So it, it updated, it needs to constantly be checking the input. So let's talk first about the input and how reactivity 
um, affects the input in Shiny. First, the input is read only to Shiny. So you can't change anything to do with um, the input in the server function or anywhere inside of your code. Only your user can enter the input and you can only read from it. So of course you can do things like you saw with the dog years, how I transformed the input into a new named variable by, by multiplying it by seven, but you can't directly try and change the input with the code. Um, let's see if this will pull up. This is a little excerpt from the book Mastering Shiny, which again is by um, Hadley Wickham and it's available for free online. And it's really good. That's where most of this is coming from. So here's a good little um, example. So unlike in a typical list, input objects are read only. And if you attempt to modify an input inside the server, you'll get an error. So here, all they've tried to do is within the server command, or sorry, object, and within the server function here, they've tried to like just set the input count value to 10. So you can't do that. Shiny can't decide what the input's going to be. Only the user can decide what the input is going to be. So if you want to name this something else like um, new underscore count is assigned to 10 plus input count, that would be fine, but you can't change or override the input that, that a user has given. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, but input also has to be read from a reactive or into a reactive, probably a better word, into a reactive context like render text. So if you noticed in all of these, uh, in all these examples, when I pull up the input that we've taken, it's always in this render text command. So even though here, all I'm doing is, is trying to use the greeting from the input, I always put it within this render text. Here again, I have opened render text before pasting together the input and these additional words for the greeting. And here I've opened render text before I tried to make this new intermediate dog age variable or create the dog age greeting. So always when, when you see this input dollar sign, whatever the name is, it's always been in render text. And this is just one option for a reactive context. And there's a few others that we'll see below. So these are render text because we were working with text, but there's also the context reactive. Um, and there's also render plot. So we'll see some of those. But the important thing is that these are reactive contexts. And what this means is that uh, input, it's, the reactive contexts are always checking back to the input to see if it's been changed. So if I change the slider, the output, like that input dollar sign age variable has to change automatically. And the only way it can do this is if it's in a reactive context. Um, and this is about, yeah, this is about reading from the input, right? So we only had to do this in the server. We didn't have to have the users give it in a reactive input, in a reactive context. We just have to kind of read to it. So I read it from a reactive context. Okay, so that was again, pretty theoretical <laughs> recap. Input can only be given to, by the user and it's read only to the server. You can't change it yourself. And input can only be read by the server within a reactive context like render text, um, render plot, or reactive. And we're going to see that uh, again in our kind of in our example here. Okay, this is the final bit of theory, but we have talked about how reactivity affects the output. So as you saw in these examples, the output is the alteration of the input that we want to put in the user interface. And it has to be rendered within this render text. And the render function, which maybe is better um, called a reactive context, the reactive context in these render functions allows the output to be automatically updated by the input. And it allows our code to be translated into HTML so it can be displayed on your app. All right, so we talked about this, about the output, the input needing to be read into a reactive context and the output coming out of the reactive context just a minute ago. And um, translating it into HTML is not something you really ever have to worry about. That's kind of the, what, what Chinese does for you. 
So here's another example from um, Mastering Shiny. So like the input, the output is picky about how you use it. You'll get an error if you forget the render function. So here, uh, we're just trying to make the output greeting. And you see, we, we don't, we're not pulling from an input here. So it doesn't feel like we need a reactive context, but uh, you do. <laughs> so this says, this would give you an error like unexpected character object. Did you forget to use a render function? So the correct uh, formulation here would be output dollar sign greeting, assignment operator, um, just render text. And then it could have hello human within it. You also can't read from an output. So you can't, um, for example, here, they tried to use output dollar sign greeting within the server function, but you can't do that. You can only use the output in the UI um, just to display it. So here you see, we display the output, but we don't try and change it in the server. The server it creates it and it's displayed in the UI. Um, and, and all these examples that we've used, like the input name and the output greeting, they have a reactive dependency. Like I said, this is kind of one of the building blocks of how Shiny does its calculations. The react reactive dependency, because the calculation of one relies on the constantly and instantly changing value of the other. So it's what allows you to change the slider and immediately see the output. All right, okay, that was um, a lot. I know that was a lot. So I have a little exercise so you can try it out yourself. I'm not sure if, uh, if it will be difficult. Maybe it's a little bit difficult. So let us know in the chat kind of how the difficulty is and let us know if you finish or if you get stuck. Um, and the exercise is to create a, an app that will serve as a party planner. You wanna ask what food the host would like to serve. I'm gonna show an example where I use a text input, um, but you could, do a, you could do a select input if you wanted. And then you wanna have two sliders, one for guests, one for food, and you wanna return how many portions each person will get. It's like a little text, like each guest at your party will receive um, three portions of lasagna or <laughs> whatever that you wanna have. Okay, so I'm gonna pause. Um, the recording. Okay, I'm going to go over, um, in the interest of time, I'll go over kind of how I made this little app um, at this really awesome party I'm throwing where I am serving green beans and each person gets one six, one six, no, 60 percent of a serving of green beans. Okay, so um, we know we need three inputs for this. We want a text input and two sliders. So I um, have created the first one with the ID of food. And I've given the question, what will you serve at your party? Then I've made a slider input, which I named portions, which I asked how many portions are you ordering? Here I set between one and 200 but you could set this whatever you want. And that I started it at the value of six, doesn't really matter. Then I made the slider input for guests where I asked how many people are you inviting? I figured maybe a hundred people is enough. So I set that max a little bit smaller um, than the one for a portion. And then I wanna show an output, which I call calculation. Now, in order to make the output called calculation, I jumped down here in my server and created output calculation. Now this needs to be in a reactive context. And we know that render text is a reactive context or a reactive environment. So I opened that up right away because I have to read input into a reactive context. I can't read it out of a reactive context. And I made this intermediate variable called per guest. And then paste it together. Each guest will receive per guest servings of food. Um, I did this as character because sometimes I was getting a little bit of an error, but I think in theory you shouldn't need it, but I did it just in case because this is a number and I need it to show as text. Okay, so one just to go through um, a couple other ways you could do this this input portions by input guests. I didn't have to make this um, additional variable, I could have done it here. In within um, this paste command. So you can see this should also still work. 
yeah. Um, so that's way to do it. But one thing you couldn't have done, which would not have worked, is if you took the per guest and tried to kind of calculate it. So maybe this looks like it would work because within the function, first you create this variable called per guest and you try and um, create the number and then you would only need to put in the calculation. Maybe you could think you could call it, but this is not gonna work. It's, um, we can see here, we threw it through this error, which is pretty helpful, which says, do you need to re react, wrap this in reactive? We can't access reactive outside of a reactive environment. So we know that that has to, the input has to be read within a reactive environment, including render text. So it could go here, for example. Uh, any questions on that? I just uploaded the solution to GitHub, so it should be there too. Okay. <laughs> then let's move on, because I wanted to show a data dashboard in Chinese. So now we've been playing around with like, just making these little sliders and inputs, but I wanted to make sure we look at doing one where we actually use like a plot. So for this, I picked a graph that we had made in the previous meetup, which was the total number of medals won in three swimming disciplines in the Paralympics from 1980 to 2016. This is, um, I have to load the tidyverse here because we have some wrangling going on and some um, ggplotting going on. Did I close my thing in? Okay. So first of all, I made a little summary table where I read in this uh, Tidy Tuesday data set from GitHub called Athletes. And I immediately do some um, data wrangling on it. So I wanted to make sure that like, it has the levels of metals and I want to make sure they were in the right order, like bronze is the lowest and then silver and gold. And I cut it down to just a couple of countries because otherwise this data set's a little bit messy. And basically what this outputs is, um, this summary table where you have the medal, the country who got it, and what year and how many they got. So. France won eight bronze medals in 1980 and, and Spain won four bronze medals in 2012. So that's the data set that we're working with. And then I have a little ggplot here, which uses that summary table to create this graph, which shows uh, the total number across years that these five countries have won. So the code for that, we have the x-axis being the number, the y-axis being the middle, and the fill being the middle. And then we're using um, a column geome and giving each country its own facet. And we've given like these gold, silver, and bronze colors. Okay, so this is the, basically, I wanna create a shiny app with this graph, but I only wanted to show like one country and I want you to be able to look, like change the country that you're looking at. I'm going to walk you through how we would do that. So let's start a new shiny app. Here I've got our little basic template, which just has library shiny. We're setting up the UI as a blank page with some text on it. We're set setting up an empty server and pulling the two together. So first things first, we can add this summary table. And I'm gonna, just to make sure that it works and everything looks good, I'm gonna display it to the user. And this is gonna work a lot like how we rendered text and outputted text, but it's gonna be with rendering tables and table output. Okay, so first what I wanna do is add um, the tidyverse library here, just to make sure that we can do the commands that we wanna do. And then I'm gonna take this, uh, code. This is basically, if you notice this part, that's what I just showed you up here, where we do the wrangling to take this Tidy Tuesday data set, pull it from the internet, and then do um, some different manipulations. And so I'm going to take that, Let's make sure I grab all of it. Let's grab this part. And I've called this output metals. 
and let's do one. output metals. And this is going to be um, a table. So we're going to use this command render table. And then all this again is just what we saw, what we had already done, like in our plain R environment. So if we, if I hadn't already done this, maybe you'd want to look at the Tidy Tuesday data, make a, do your wrangling and get down to your summary table, um, kind of in a regular R environment, make sure it looks good, and then you could kind of copy paste it like I did into render table environment. And then of course we want to make sure that we show this table. So we want to have table output here, and I've called it metals. Let's see if I typoed anything. Um, again, I'll try to move this so you can kind of see the code at the same time, or at least some of it. And now you see that the app just shows this table, which is the same table we looked at kind of in our, our studio a moment ago. So all we've done is taken the wrangling to make the summary table and kind of put it in this render table environment or command in um, the server, named it output metals, and then shown the table output for metals to the user interface. So now we know that we've like read in the data, it can be shown and worked with a shiny. And so that was kind of a new command of render table and table output. And the very same thing can be done with render plot and show plot output. So what we need to do here is add the um, the plot that the plot code that we've seen. And what I'm first going to do is actually take this out of the render table because I don't need it to be rendered as a table anymore. And because um, none of this is coming from the input and none of this is like going directly to the output, it doesn't have to be in the reactive context. I don't believe. <laughs> Let's see. So what I've done is kind of just called this summary table on its own. And then you won't be able to output the table anymore. So now we can just kind of have this object in the shiny environment, but we don't have to have it in a in a um, reactive context. And this is kind of important because yeah, here I've noted it here. It doesn't need to be in a reactive context because it will never change based on the input. And this also means that you don't, it doesn't have to be reloaded every time that someone changes the input. So if someone wants to look at a different country, we don't need the Shiny app to go pull the data from GitHub again, do the wrangling again, and then show the output. We can have them do that only once, and that's never going to change based on the input of the output. So we're not trying to read from the input, and we're not trying to directly create output from it so it can go on its own server kind of floating in there. Um, the plot data, on the other hand, does need to be in a reactive context because we want it to be sensitive to the input that the user gives. So I think we called it metals. And here we want um, render plot as our environment. And then I'm just going to grab from here um, the ggplot code that we had above. and put it here in the render plot and give it the name output metals. And then I can show the plot output metals here. I'm gonna run this, but I'm gonna let you look at the code again in a second because I know that was a lot. Okay, so now all we have in our um, Chinese app right now is this full kind of faceted uh, ggplot the same way that we saw it in our, our markdown environment. So just to recap, I've made the summary table just on its own, like normal R code within the server, because it doesn't need to be changed by the input. We don't need to reload it or redo the wrangling every single time that the input changes. Uh, it's also not trying to use the input in any way. So I've left it just once to be called by the server whenever it needs it. And then render plot is needed because we we will want this to be able to be changed by the by the um, by the user. Right now, there's not the option, but there will be. Uh, there's a question in the chat, Kyla. Um, 
Does summary table, does it have to be placed in server or can it go somewhere else? Can it be outside? Uh, I think it does have to be in server. So I don't want to say like 100% because um, I'm not sure like off the top of my head if I can really think through all the possibilities. But I, I'm going to go with yes, it does have to be in server because this part of the server when it's looking to render the plot is going to look for the object summary table. And so it should be within the server because that's kind of like it's domain or like it's um, arena where it can find objects it needs. So whenever it comes across, hey, I need to find summary table, it can find it within the server. So I'm going to say yes, I think most code either has to go in the UI or in the server function. Yeah, but good question. Okay, so um, again, this with the input has to happen in a reactive context and we don't wanna put too much uh, inside the reactive context necessarily so that not everything has to be reloaded. So when we can take things out of the reactive context that could help. So I already took that out, um, but what we do wanna do, I don't know if I changed something here. I think I already did that. Okay, so we that's what we already did, that we took the summary table out of the reactive context, but it is still within the server command, yeah. So we're already on step five. Okay, so now we want to, what I want to be able to do is have like a drop down where you can pick which country you want to see, and it's going to show only that country in the, in your app, so you can like switch through the five countries here. So we know from um, above that, that means we need a select input. And I think I've called this country, let me check. The label is going to be maybe like, which country do you want to see? That's not very inspired, but work with me here. And then the choices, I'm gonna copy paste here so I don't mess up. Okay. So the choices um, are gonna be Germany, France, Spain, Italy, or Poland. Okay. Let's see, I was getting some X's there. So let's see if I did something wrong. Okay, so now you have this dropdown which says which country would you like to see, but no matter what you pick, you still see this plot output of metals. So the dropdown is available, but it's not doing anything. Um, did I see a question? Uh, someone was asking about how to exactly what you're showing right now, I think. <laughs> so just continue. And if there are questions at the end, we can answer them then. <laughs> okay. 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 So I, what I've done here is this is the input and then the output I want to show is metals. I've created the metals object down here. So that's all we're seeing is the input and the metals. So what we want to do is make sure that this country, something about it, um, influence, influences the plot. So right now I have a facet wrap. And in case you're not super familiar with ggplot, that just means that each country, because I've faceted by country, will get like its own mini plot next to each other. I don't want that. I actually only want to see one, um, one country. So I'm going to take that out. And instead of that, what I want to do is filter the summary table down to only include the data that the user wants to see. Um, so what I'm going to do for that is for ggplot, you can kind of pipe in the data to the plot. So I'm taking summary table and feeding it in as the data to ggplot. But because I pipe like this, I can add like an additional command. So I'm going to quickly add a filter command so that the country is equal to the country that the user gives as that they want to see. Um, let's see if that works. Again, I'll move that so you can see. Oopsie. Okay. Let's copy paste. Um, let's copy paste and see what I did wrong. Hmm. 
Okay, so this is what I wanted to happen that you can pick the drop down and um, it will change the plot. In theory. Okay, let's see what's happening here. Um, oh, I think I just typoed this that you take the summary table. So again, you have the summary table here and then you can filter it so that the country here, I've just actually given it Germany. I think I want to show an intermediate step where you could like filter to show only Germany. But then what we can easily do is just change this to input country. I think all I did last time was actually forgot the double equal sign. So input uh, country. And now when you change the drop down, it's gonna change which country you're looking at in the bar graph. Okay, so let me just kind of summarize that and show you what I just did, just to make sure that it's kind of clear. We have the user interface, which has two parts. I wonder if I can fit this on my tiny screen. It has two parts. The first part is this select input, which allows you to give the country, it says, which country would you like to see? And then it has the choices, Germany, France, Spain, Italy, or Poland. And we also have the second part of the input, which is this plot output called metals. Behind the scenes in the server, we're reading in the data, changing it around a little bit. This is only necessary because this data wasn't exactly in the format that I wanted to use it in but I've just made it so that we know how many countries each, uh, sorry, how many medals each country has won per year. And then we have this reactive plot, which we know it's reactive because it's within render plot, which takes our data, it filters it. So the only country that is in the, the data that the plot is getting is equal to whatever the user gave as input. And then it's creating the plot given that filtered data set and um, sending it back to the user interface called metals so that we can call it with plot output. Um, and that's it. So I'm gonna, this is gonna be on GitHub. So of course you can take a closer look at the code if you need to. Um, I didn't really get the, we didn't get the chance to do like an exercise on this, but I think we will have another shiny meetup in the future. So we, we definitely have time to practice. There's also more stuff we could do to make this um, data dashboard like a little bit more aesthetic and easy to use. Like we can add columns and sidebars so that we could have kind of our select on one side and our plot in the middle. And if you do want to get started from this, some things to keep in mind, uh, color palettes are really good for using ggplot. So you saw here, every single country had exactly three levels of metals. That's why the colors worked. But if, you're, if your country will change, you might need a palette. Um, that's something we'll probably also go over in the next meetup. And then just make sure that you are aware of these reactive contexts, maybe play around a little bit so you can get an intuition for when something needs to be in a reactive context versus when it doesn't. But yeah, so there we've achieved our first reactive um, plot data dashboard and um, the rest we can cover in future meetups. So I hope you join us for those.